title of our message last week was The Conclusion of Me. The Conclusion of Me. I don't know if this past week, since you've heard the beginning of this short message, this short series, you begin to think about our future, our tomorrow. Not only our present, as we spoke of last week, we, we understand that today's society is so involved with today. We're so involved with what we're doing, with what we're trying to accomplish, we were, what we're trying to gather for ourselves, so involved with this world, this moment in our lives today. That in all the hustle and bustle that we go through in a day, preparing for this moment and preparing just for the future of tomorrow, should the Lord give us one, that's as far as we go. Now we may take uh, a little time to go off on a tangent and think about next summer's vacation or this Christmas visitations and gifts and all these things. That's fine, but it's always about today. That in all of this planning that we do, in all of this living that we do, we forget about tomorrow. And when I say tomorrow, I speak of eternity. I speak about the end of things. Let it be on earth, should Jesus come and rapture his church. Or let it be the end of us upon the face of this planet. The premise of this message the objective is to get us to think about that. We spoke last week, and I'm just paraphrasing everything that we went through because I don't want to go through everything again. We'll never finish. But we spoke about how forgetful we are when it comes to our tomorrow, our conclusion. What is going to be said of us? What will we say of ourselves? What have we gathered for ourselves during this short time span we call life. I read a couple of passages and I'll just bring them up to your memory once again as I kind of briefly touch the pages that we've been through uh, this past uh, week. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, o Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Remember, it begins with saying, this is what God wants for you. This is God's plan for your life. That we love the Lord, that we fear the Lord, that we live for God. All the days of our lives. Now, Ecclesiastics seem to be the passage of choice because from here we take the word that we use to title this sermon. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13 says, Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. These are powerful words, especially in a very busy society and generation that we live in today. When someone tells you all you're supposed to do is this, we are such a creative mind-filled people that we have plans for ourselves. We have desires for ourselves. We have futures for ourselves. We have things that we want to do for ourselves. But here the Word of God is telling us that everything in your life is resolved and concludes to this. Nothing else matters. Nothing should be more important than this conclusion to the matter. To fear God and to keep His commandments... For this is the whole duty. This is your job. This is your employment. This is your commission. This is your tour of duty here on earth. To keep his commandments. And here comes the word of encouragement as to why we need to pay attention to these words that we are given. It says, because in the end... God will bring every deed into judgment. Ouch. 
God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing. Even those things in the computer you delete. Even the things on your phone you have passwords to. Even those little secret things your wife doesn't know about. The little things mom and dad haven't found in your room. Even those things God is going to expose. He's going to bring all these things we have done in life into judgment. Whether it be good, which is a good thing. Because then the Bible says to us that the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him and seek him diligently. So I hope he finds all good things. Because when he finds good things, he's a rewarder of good things. But it doesn't stop there. We just wish there was a period there. But there is no period there. It says, well, including the hidden things, whether it is good or evil. Or evil. Ouch. Evil. God has a specific way to deal with evil. And so we are told that the business of our lives is to seek the Lord, to fear him. Because one day the conclusion is going to bring the reward. Because the closing chapter of your life where they turn the last page of your book called life, that conclusion is going to bring the reward of your existence and everything you've done. There will be nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. We read that out of Revelation in 20 and 11. I won't read it. It's too long a passage, but you should read it at home. It speaks to us how the grave will surrender the dead, how the oceans will surrender the dead, how the mountains will surrender the dead, how the graves will surrender the dead, how everything, he said everything. That means that there is nothing you can't hide like Saul. When the Lord was looking for him, he went, the Bible says, and he ran and he hid behind the baggage. You can't run and hide like Adam in the garden after they had sinned and transgressed against God. That God had to come back and say, Adam. No hiding. The Bible says that under the Lord, the night is like day. The Bible says that one day the Lord will walk with his lantern through the city. He'll be lighting his light upon everyone. And you know, sometimes in your house, no matter how clean you think it is, when you turn the light, you see little roaches. Shh, shh. <laughs> I don't want to be a roach on that day. And I pray after this morning, you won't want to be a roach on that day. That when he turns on the light to expose everything you have done, whether good or evil, you can stand there boldly and say, I am here, Lord. Examine me. Take me in your hands and look at my life. But all these things will begin to mean something. You see, eternity means very little to a vast part of this world. Because they have forgotten that there is a conclusion to all things. And so the question of the hour that this conversation between you and I makes is, what will be the conclusion of you? If it's God's conclusion, we read about that already. I read out of Jeremiah 29, 11 last week for you and told you that the Lord has plans to bless you, to prosper you, not harm you, to give you an expected future. See, God wants to bless you. I have no trouble preaching sermons of blessing. Those are my favorite. 
But blessings alone aren't going to get you to heaven. You need the blesser. You can't be asking for things and just receive things and all these good things. You remember the rich man and Lazarus I mentioned last week. He had a lot of things. But that wasn't enough to get him to heaven. You remember that young rich ruler who was walking and saw Jesus by the roadside. And he thought he'd be smart in his, all, in his intellect and said, Lord, a Rabbi, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And the Lord gave him a couple of rules and regulations that the scripture mentioned in Exodus 20. He said, oh, that's nothing. That's a piece of cake. Then the Lord told him, and go and take all your riches and your things and sell them and give them to the poor. Then come back and follow me. Ow. You see, the Bible says he will expose all things. See, that young man didn't think that the Lord could not see his pride and greed in his heart. But God sees all things. See, these things would mean something for us. If we gave importance to our conclusion. God wants to bless you. You know you have no idea. How much God wants to bless you. If you did you'd be all over God every day. Just like you used to be all over your dad. When you knew it was Friday he got his trembling paycheck. Hi dad. You'd be all over him because your dad would pull something out to bless on you and just love on you or your mom. But he wants to bless you so much. You know, the Bible says you, can't, you don't have no imagination vast enough to think about how he wants to bless you. You believe that? Yeah. Look at Ephesians 3.20. Would you put that on the screen, guys? I don't want somebody saying, well, he's just chopping away up there like a smart guy. What does it say? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or what? Tell your neighbor you have no clue. Tell him you have no clue. You think you know, but you have no clue. He wants to bless you so much you are absolutely ignorant of how much he wants to bless you. And still, he's the last one we consider in our lives at times. Oh, Jesus, help us. So if it was God's conclusion that you seek, then you know it's going to be a good place. The scripture has expressed that to us and what we'll find. The second option, obviously, is not a good place. Because it's not a conclusion that God designed I told you last week, I said, every man has the choice of two conclusions in his life. Everyone, young and old, from every part of the world has the choice of two conclusions. You will choose God's conclusion for your life or your own conclusion. God won't even include himself in your conclusion because that wasn't God's plan for you. You will concoct your own conclusion and end up in the wrong place because of something you designed for yourself. The conclusion of me. So what is it that should be priority for us these days? Let me tell you just a couple of things that I think are important for us to embrace if our conclusion is to be God's conclusion. Number one, and I speak to every soul in this house, not religious people, but people who know they need God. The first thing in the line of order for us as we live our lives is to win Christ. Is Christ in your heart today? I'm not talking about you having your name on Rock of Ages roster. Being a part of the men's group or going to Sunday school. Being part of the worship team. Doing something that's notable in the church. The biggest giver in the church. Whatever. My question to you is, is your name in the Lamb's book of life? 
Are you saved? The Bible tells us, Paul speaking to us in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. We read this before because we went through this point. But just to reiterate or give you a backflash, if I can use that term, Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, Do you not know that in a race all runners run? But only one gets the prize. Only one. So run in such a way to get the prize for everyone that competes uh, in the games, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. This is what winners win here on, on the face of this earth. Nothing. Medals that rot and decay. Trophies that break. I take a gander and say that some of you who were sports stars in your high school had trophies that don't have an arm anymore. He was throwing a basketball, but now there's no ball and no arm. Because trophies in this world decay and they fall apart and they are worthless. And the Bible says that in this world, people run for those kinds of trophies. But not you, the Bible says. We run to get a crown that will last forever. Forever, no decay, no breaking off of jewels. You don't have to take it back to the jeweler to put some of those zirconians in there. You know why I know that word? Because I can't buy my wife that. I've tried, you know, and they're worth like $60. This is not real. This is glass. Say, so, well, I guess we won't pay our house bill this week, but go ahead. <laughs> you see, but that crown that we run for is not a zirconian, not a piece of glass. It's the real thing. And it lasts forever. It will not tarnish. And so we need to fight for that. We need to run for that. The Bible uses the term, Paul said, strict training. We need to take control of who we are to keep our conclusion at sight. I'm not a runner, but I dare say that anyone who competes always keeps their eye upon the goal. Even if they're yelling at him, he's looking at the goal. Even if they're doing this or the other on the side, making all kinds of chaos and noise, and they, he's still running towards the goal. The Bible says in Matthew 7 and 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. You see, it's a direct line. It's a direct and focused run with God. We need to win Christ for ourselves in our lives. Do you have Christ or do you have religion? Religion will not save you. I don't care how many prayers, how many candles, how many rosaries, how many this or the other. That will not buy you a ticket to heaven. It's only those who have been blood washed and saved by the master's son, Jesus. The second thing I will mention this morning is not only to find and win Christ, but to be found in him constantly. To have a sense of continuance in our lives, if that's proper English at all. To have fluidity in our walk with God, a constant on a daily basis. You see, Salvation is not something temporary, but it's the building and establishing of a staying relationship. It's an everyday thing. It's the beginning of a tireless relationship. A relationship that has been designed to last forever. Right now we are living in eternity. Right now. We are living in our spirit, in our heart, in salvation. We're already, we're becoming and we're transforming to one day, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be caught up together. But it begins now. I don't know if I've always agreed with doctrinally with that 
song that says when we all get to heaven. I'm sure that one day we'll all be glorified because the scripture says so. But you know what? Heaven begins the moment you're saved. Because now you have a direct connection with heaven. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of God. This is a relationship that will last for an eternity. We must learn to love God not only today but tomorrow and the next. Hebrews 10 and 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. How much of what we do during the day draws us near to God? Verse 23 in the same chapter says, let us hold unswervingly without fluctuation. It's almost... Just monotonous that I mentioned this from this pulpit. There are so many Christmas tree light Christians in this world today. They're on today and off tomorrow. Maybe I should use a lot of seesaw Christians today. Up today and down tomorrow. And there is no consistency. We need to be born again today and stay born again Till we see him face to face. The Bible says that only those who remain till the end, they shall be what? What? Saved. Saved. What if that seesaw is on the ground when Jesus comes? What if that Christmas tree light religious walk that you walk is off on that day? What happens? The conclusion. What will the conclusion be? So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. We go down to verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. How do you like that? These are hard sayings, aren't they? These are difficult sayings. These are hard to read. As I mentioned last week, everybody glosses through the scripture of blessings. But you see, the ones, the verses that are dusty are these. And they're the most important passages. Because they have to do with our salvation and us keeping and staying saved, consecrated, seeking the Lord with everything we can. And it goes on to say in the same verse that we were reading, verse 27 of chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, part B says, a fearful expectation of judgment. Of the raising fire that will consume the enemies of God. You know what it's talking to about, about us there? Our conclusion. The conclusion of you. The conclusion of me. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. And therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. So ladies and gentlemen, if we want God's conclusion, we need to learn to live for him. We need to learn to submit and live for him. And the third thing I'll mention this morning, and I'm moving a little bit faster now. Is to live in the power of salvation. To live in the power of salvation. John 14 and 12. This is what Jesus said. He said very uh, uh, truly I tell you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. So that the Father will be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You know what this mainly pokes out at us, what it's telling us? For sure, one thing, it should teach us that prayer is important. 
that prayer is important. The most ill-attended service that any church around the world has is the service of prayer. Not realizing that that is the vehicle that God gave us to communicate, to be able to be connected with heaven. The Lord, when he saves us, he deposits heaven in your heart. And we are called to live in the power of the kingdom of God. You see, salvation doesn't come to us, ladies and gentlemen, just simply as a, a means to an end. It is the beginning of a great journey. Again, I say to you, it's a great deployment. It's commission, a tour of duty. Now we can walk in the glory and the power of God because we are saved. You know why evil reigns in this world? Because that's just the way it is. No. It's because the church isn't living in the power of salvation. Isn't living in the power we have received from the Lord. You know, we've learned to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That's proper. But I'm wondering if the Lord is, looks at us and says, you want me to bring heaven down again? I gave it to you. Your responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, my responsibility, the church's responsibility in this day and age is not to pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. See, that's just waiting for someone else. Like said, Jesus is going to come back again and do something else. No, you know, the Lord is waiting for you to release heaven. To release heaven. To open your mouth and release heaven. He has given you the power in conjunction with the help of the Holy Spirit. We are called. We are commissioned. We are authorized to loosen. The Bible says that whatever you loose in heaven hmm, will be loose on earth. Whatever you bind. There's a direct connection. So we should wait as if Christ is going to come back and do something else for us, come to save us from this wretched world we live in? No, 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 no. It's not going to happen. The next time he comes, he's going to come and rapture his church. But he's not going to come handle business for you, the business he gave us to do. He's not going to come and say, well, what would you leave undone? <sighs> no, 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 no. No, no, he already did the work. I said he already did the work. It's our responsibility to live in the power of that work. This is why we can speak to devils and they will flee. This is why we can speak deliverance to our schools and they will flee. We can speak deliverance to our young people and they will be delivered. We can speak to sickness and it will go. Cancer is no power against the power of Christ in our lives. If we're going to experience the conclusion of God for us in the end of all things, we must learn to live in the authority and the power of that salvation we have received. You see, in the Bible, we have story after story, testimony after testimony of men of God and women of God who opened their mouth and they let the kingdom out. They opened their mouth and they let the glory of God flow. Read out of 2 Chronicles 7. You'll find when, that when Solomon prayed for the temple, he loosened the blessing. And the Bible says that heaven began to pour down. So much did heaven begin to pour down that he himself, along with the rest of the priests, could do nothing because the kingdom, the Shekinah glory of God was so present in the house of God. In Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23, we find Moses and Aaron who also prayed and they loosened the kingdom of God. And when they stopped praying at that moment, they had loosened the glory of the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord appeared to all the people. So what's keeping God from our churches? Well, he must just really be disappointed and doesn't want to come to Rock of Ages and the rest of the churches. No, you know what it is? 
the people refuse to loosen him. The church refuses to let God out. If you would stand up right now and begin to loosen the glory of God in this house, my friend, we will be here for days. I'll tell you, your sickness will flee because no sickness can stand to be in the presence of the Lord. No devil. You see, we, we need to get to a real relationship with God, ladies and gentlemen. I've, I've had enough. I've been preaching for 36, 37 years now, and I'm tired of telling you the same thing. I told somebody one time, they said, Pastor, you're tired. I said, yeah, I'm preaching the same. Well, you know, uh, you, uh, you know, one good sermon. I said, no, no, if it took one good sermon, I would have preached it one time. You would have learned, and my job was over. But I got to come back every Sunday. I've been coming back for 37 years every Sunday to tell you live in the power of salvation. Live in the power of God. Loosen the power of the Lord. Why don't you loosen the power of the Lord? You want God in the house? Loosen God in the house. You want healing? Loosen God over yourself. You want healing in your schools, in our nation? You want the devil to be suppressed and taken captive again? Then loosen the power of God. Live in the power of God. Oh, how many excuses are we going to give? Well, God must not want to. No, no, no. God's going to say, you never wanted to. I did it all. That's why he's hung on the cross that day and he said, it is. It is. It is. What does that mean? There's nothing else for me to do. I give you all authority. I give you all authority. You will trample over sickness. You will trample over sermons. You will trample all the oppressive things that come in your life. Because me, I'm going back to the Father. I finished my work. Don't call me for any repairs. You're the one that's breaking stuff. I hope our visitors will come back. Are you praising the Lord this morning? Are you praising the Lord this morning, my brother? Will you come back and hear this old man shout at you again? He just came. The devil just put that in here. Do it again. They're leaving. Too bad, devil. They're believers. Ha, 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 They're believers. I'm done. It's enough stroke. I better finish now. Ladies and gentlemen, I think about my conclusion. I want you to think about yours. I don't want you to walk around in life thinking about death. I want you to walk around thinking about heaven. And everything you do in life, as we mentioned that man that found that pearl and went back and sold everything. I talked to you about that last week. The Bible says he sold everything he had. And I know that we can't sell everything we have, but this is, I think, the implication. The implication is whatever it is that's not leading you to that great pearl of price, get rid of that. Enough. How long are you going to play? Jesus is going to come. You see, you need to believe that. Don't forget that. The Bible says that he is not slow as many presume to be slowness. But he's being patient. For some of us, I'm telling you, he's being very patient. I got a good mind to go today and boo. <laughs> but he's patient wanting everyone to come to repentance. Why? Because he wants you to know the conclusion of you. Would you stand to your feet for me? Just a moment. I'm still not done today, so don't start packing your bags. I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. Guys, if you would just play something very lightly back there. Very lightly. 
We're speaking about eternity this morning. We're speaking about remembering the whole duty, the whole responsibility of us. And we've learned this morning that everything that you and I as believers are called to do first and foremost is to fear the Lord, to love Him, to walk with Him, to live for Him, to walk in His power. This is why the Bible tells you and me, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. And then whatever it is, your education, your home, your car, your job, your, your financial increase, the blessings, and all these things. You don't worry about that. Don't put the chariot before the horse. Some of us are looking at the chariot doing all these other things. Oh, we're planning, we're doing, and we're not thinking about what it is that's going to get us there. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When we get those priorities right, young people, you can be sure of your conclusion. When you get those priorities down right, Dad, you won't have to worry about your conclusion. <laughs> Whenever you get your priorities right, sister, Mom, you won't have to worry about your conclusion. That's divine order right there. In that passage, you find the definition of divine order. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord told Saul on that day. He said, you go out there and you meet with those prophets. The spirit of the Lord is going to come over you. Then... Whatever you take with your hand will be blessed. But you see, there's divine order. There's a way that God has ordained things. You must first be saved. You must first commit to walk with God, to love Him enough, to come to church, to read your word, to testify, to witness. You need to love God. What we are experiencing in the church today, ladies and gentlemen, is the lack of love of God. Look at your life. You can't just flippantly or just simply foolishly say, oh, I love God. Yet you don't read God's word. You don't pray. You don't come to church. You can't say that. Not only will you not believe yourself, but others won't believe you. And certainly the most important one, God does not believe you. What will be the conclusion of that kind of living? See, because that kind of living is your own concoction. You're, it's your own developing. It's your own design. So you have to expect your own conclusion. But if it's God's, It'll be different because God will be priority in your life. You will pray. You will love Him. You will seek Him. You will walk in the power of salvation in your life. You won't be praying, oh Lord, bring heaven over me. You'll be loosening heaven from within you. Oh Lord, send me power from heaven. You'll be releasing the power that God has given you through the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. We won't be waiting for a mail out from heaven to see if somehow God will come and intervene and do something for us when God will say, you never did it for yourself. This is why he said, ask of me. And I'll do anything. Anything that's going to bring glory to the Father, ask of me. You have not because you ask not. You want a good conclusion. You want God's conclusion. Then win Christ for yourself this morning.
fear the Lord and walk in His ways, walk in His power, then we don't have to worry.